Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 Radio Program. I'm Daniel Davis. In recognition of Black History Month, we're going to be hearing a very little-known tale that happened in America back in 1921. It happened in a town near Tulsa, Oklahoma, a town known as Greenwood. The the incident related to an oil production and the wealth that was gained from it, and in 2001, a case was taken to the Supreme Court by famous attorney Johnny Cochran and a team of high-level lawyers to represent the surviving victims of this atrocity in hopes of financial reparations. On the program today is someone who is an expert with black history. He is a professor that teaches at Portland State University and is here to share this story with us because if we forget what happens, it will probably happen again. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program today, our guest, Ron Weber. Ron, thank you for joining us here on the program today. Good morning, Dan. Nice to be with you uh, once again. I always enjoy your show. Now, this is really an interesting tale here, and it's one that kind of makes you cringe. And, you know, it's interesting because, just to give our audience an idea, you're in your 60s, and you're a white male. How did you get involved with black history? What what was the interest there? You know, I grew up in Portland in in a, uh, what would be considered at the time, a white republic. You know, my father had a business, and and uh, racist. We had live in hell, Dan, and but they couldn't be black. There were no black people in my neighborhood, in in the schools, uh, just nowhere. There was just I, you know, I did not see um, growing up in Catholic schools and living where I did in the West Hills. I did not physically see or stand in front of a black person. I never met one until I was 19 years old. I was in Korea in the army. Wow, you know, and it, it was the farthest thing from my mind. And throughout my throughout my life, I you know, a, a few things happened that my mother taught at the University of Portland, and she was head of the foreign department, and introduced me to uh, Middle Eastern and African students. And slowly, this kind of, this thing kind of came up on board. But we were isolated growing up. I called it racism by exclusion. You know, we just never saw them. So. Um, what, what got me into black history is, is uh, you know, I'll give you the short version, which is sometimes hard for me to do, and we have a lot of fun with that, don't we? Uh, I, when my, my wife and I have been married for 42 years, Lydia, and one night at the dinner table, I made a really, um, she says she never called me an idiot, but she did. I made this, I don't even know how to describe it. She worked for a grade school, that was for 25 years, and it was renamed after a principal. It was the Gladstone Grade School right here in the Portland area, and it was named after John Wetton. And I saw a school in, in northeast Portland one day. I drove by, and it said um, the Harriet Tubman Middle School. So that night at the dinner table, I said to my wife, oh, I saw one of those schools out there, you know, that was uh, – like yours, you know, named after an old principal. And <laughs> she says, what school is that? And I said, it's the Harriet Tubman Middle School. <laughs> she says, you idiot, Harriet Tubman Middle School. I mean, I mean, you know, Harriet Tubman is a very famous black person. She's not a former principal in a Portland, Oregon school. Oh, I just felt terrible, Dad. I felt terrible. So growing up Catholic, we always had to do, you know, we, we'd be punished for doing book reports, by doing book reports if we did something wrong. So I went to the library. I got a book on Harry Tubman, Sojourner Truth, and Frederick Douglass. And I read those books, and and I wrote book reports. And then I dialed the Portland uh, (laughs) directory assistants and said, is there a newspaper in the city of Portland that is for black people, and this, she comes back and she says, well, there's two, and, and there's the scanner, and there is the Portland Observer, and I dialed the number, and all these years later, it was your lovely bride before you met her, answered the phone, <laughs> and, and I told her my story, and I wanted to redeem myself by writing an article or two about black history. And she laughed, and I sent some stuff over, and she liked it. And 15, 16 years later, 
I have um, written hundreds of, of newspaper articles and, and magazines, and probably 12 years ago I started doing some public speaking. I just felt like an idiot that I didn't know anything about black people. Shame on me. So that's how I got started. <laughs> well, that's certainly quite a story, no doubt about that. Now, tell us about this massacre that happened in 1921. This one here was considered to be one of the worst, if not the worst, in American history. Yes. Uh, I have heard that uh, only um, you know some of the early massacres of, of Indians in our country would, would equal this. And it, it, um, it, and the, the South at the time... You know, it was a, just a tinderbox waiting for something to happen. And on a Monday afternoon, this was May 30th, 1921, kind of take yourself back there and uh, imagine what it looked like in, in the South in 1921. And a young man named um, a 19-year-old, Dick Rowland, he, uh, he was a shoe shiner outside a building. In, in Tulsa, and it was called the Drexler Building. And he had been there for, oh, maybe two years, and he would, uh, if he needed to go to the bathroom, he was allowed to use a bathroom on the third floor of the building. Now, why that particular bathroom, I don't know, but it was the only one he was allowed to use. And that did kind of surprise me a little bit, Dan, as, as you know, that, that, that allows him to go up through the building. And this is in, you know, the white section of Tulsa. I, in my own thinking, he, you know, you'd have something out back or downstairs. This is just what happened, but this is what set it off. And coming down the elevator after a bathroom break, this man tripped. Dick tripped. And if you remember the old elevators, and we're talking the, you know, Meyer and Frank in Portland, Oregon, where the, and and they'd keep uh, raising and lowering them, and it would take two or three attempts to get the elevator leveled, and, and the operator would be saying, watch your step, watch your step. Well, this man tripped and on the first floor, and his natural instinct was to reach out and grab or something. You know, we'd all, we'd all do that. We'd trip, we'd throw our arms out. And he accidentally grabbed the arm of and the, the elevator operator. Now, this gal was, was 17 years old. She was this little white girl named Sarah Page. And his, his sudden lunging forward and grabbing her arm caused her to scream. I mean, that's something anybody would do. And her scream brought some workers from the first floor of this structure building. The first thing they saw running out of their little shops is this black man on the floor, on the ground outside the elevator, and a white girl inside screaming and looking terrified. And that was it. That was the, it was like lighting a stick of dynamite while standing in a 55-gallon drum of gasoline. I mean, the 1921, you know, it was on. Racism was on. So down the hall, uh, a couple of them come to protect this poor Sarah from this, horrible black man they thought had hurt her. He wasn't a horrible black man. And by the way, uh, rumors have persisted uh, all the way through that they were actually a boyfriend and girlfriend. But, you know, that was something that nobody wanted to talk about. So Dick sees people running and yelling at him, and he just took off. You know, what else would a young black man do with a bunch of whites chasing him? And here, here's what happened. So the story spread quickly, and he was arrested the following day for attempted rape on a white girl. Now, Dan, you and some of the listeners might be saying, well, um, I mean, hello, why, why, why didn't Sarah just tell the truth? Now, think about this. Why, why, would a, um, why would a nice young black man who had worked for whites and was allowed to walk around in, in that part of town, suddenly attack an underage white girl in an elevator in a building full of white people in broad daylight. Dan, this just makes no sense. But 
in the racially charged South at that time, uh, she could have been, Sarah Page could have been killed for defending a, a black man. Mm -hmm. He could have, you know, her, her family uh, would have been harassed. She would have been accused of favoring blacks. Uh, oh, it's your, you know, you're, 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 that's your boyfriend. You're doing something with him. And she had to do, she had to roll with the racist tides. That was all she could do. And mm -hmm. she just kept her mouth shut and, and let it happen. Now, before we go any farther, I want to explain to you something. You were just talking about the, the oil. Okay. So here we are. We're post-World War I, and we're in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And oil was almost the entire economy of Oklahoma in the 1920s. Oil was, it was they were just driven by oil. And the World War, World War I, had... Um, driven a huge demand for oil. Without oil, we would have never won that war. The ships, planes, tanks, jeeps, troop carriers, uh, I mean, er everything like that required oil. So now, after the war ended, the demand for oil dropped. It dropped sharply. Fortunately, we have the auto industry stepping in, ramping it up, it didn't solve, you know, the entire problem, but it helped a great deal. Okay, now here we have another problem, and that's the that's the use of the fuel itself, where we get it, because the fuel itself is what fueled planes and ships that come from around the world that would deliver oil. So what I'm telling you is that now we had to compete. And we had to we had to keep our prices reasonable. So let's now now we've we've established how important the oil is. Let's talk a little bit about who works in the oil, mm -hmm. who works in the oil field. Initially, you know, this land down there was undesirable. It had been set aside for Indians and blacks who had been given the you know forty acres and a mule, also for other people just to migrate to. And, uh, the, you know, the, set them over here. If you remember with the Native Americans, we often took the good land and gave them crummy land. So here they are in this tough state, and it's hard to grow things down there in this area. The ground's hard. There's nothing there. Suddenly, oil is discovered. And the economy, it's just, I mean, Dan, it just, it just soared for decades. While the whites were getting rich, so were the non-whites, and everybody was you know, everybody was pretty happy. Racism was, of course, at an all-time high, but you know who, who cares? We're all getting rich, so it, it it worked itself out. So now, picture the demand for oil uh, really high during the war, and then um, somebody, please tell me, you know, maybe one of the listeners can tell me, maybe you can tell me. Where are we going to get our labor? Dan and Ron just left for the war. The place was emptied out. Young white men initially uh, enlisted, but then towards the end of the war, you know, we didn't have enough. So we, they started a draft. They drafted uh, whites and some blacks, mostly whites. So where are we going to get the labor? And we're going to hire blacks. By the way, I say whites and blacks a lot just because it's a simple term. I don't, I don't want anybody offended by blacks, whites, blacks, whites. It's just, it's just what happens when you're talking and using the words a lot. Africa, African American had not, you know, the, the term had not come yet. So here we are, and the the blacks are now running the oil fields, and suddenly. And they're doing a good job of it. Tulsa is still booming. Now, the war ends, and what happens now? All these white people come back. And for three years, the blacks have been running the, running the show. We had uh, the population in Tulsa, by the way, in 1921 was around 90,000 people. 
Okay, let's let's move to Greenwood. Greenwood is on the north side of Tulsa. This is the black neighborhood. And they had 10,000 people. So the population is 90,000 versus 10,000. This this is a um, it's a recipe for disaster with all these unemployed whites coming back. So Dan, you 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 own um, an oil, uh, a, a, you know, some kind of an oil business. You are processing it. You've got a refinery, and uh, eighty percent of your employees are black. How are you going to handle this? Mm -hmm. you've, you've got hundreds of white men coming back and saying, "Okay, can we have our jobs back?" Now, that, that was not an easy task for anybody. And what what sparked, you know, the the, the Dick Rowland incident caused, well, you know, it was, it was the match that lit the can of gas. They were just waiting for something to happen. What led up to it was we had all these American heroes coming back, both black and white. And now we have all these these, you know, over nine times the population. We have unemployed whites are lining the sidewalks outside of businesses trying to find work. The war is over. The economy is slowing down. These guys were heroes. They were in a world war, and, and we won it. But now they couldn't even feed their families. I'm talking about the humiliation and frustration of, of and, and poverty. And who do these guys see that were unemployed? Who they see driving by them in nice cars on their way to their nice homes, their jobs, and their families? Black people, that's who. So what was happening, just to give our listeners you know, a little update, is that what you had was blacks going into the oil fields during the wars to basically keep oil production going. And then on the return, you know, here are white people that are jobless that really want to see about getting their jobs back. Then you have this incident between a white woman and a black man was just, you know, basically a reflex to keep from falling down, which kind of set off a lot of aggravation that was already there as a result of people feeling disenfranchised, so to speak. And it sounds to me like the black population was actually thriving financially as well. Yes. I mean, the Greenwood uh, community was just a, a, you know, they, and we'll be talking about that a little bit, but it was a, a beautiful little district. And... It had to be, uh, and you know, and, and, I, and I hope the readers can can understand that uh, you know we're back in time now. And when if if you, there's probably not enough of the listeners old enough to remember what it was like in 1921, but and prior to that, we're only decades out of the you know the Civil War, and we're only maybe two generations out of that. There's still a lot of anger. And um, people lost their their farms and they lost their businesses because you know, mean America took back, took away their their free labor. This is how a lot of families felt. My grandfather went bankrupt. You know, we, we lost our plantation. So now here these guys are earning money. And everything in the South was so racially charged in those days. It's just hard. It's even hard for me doing as much work as I have on it. I, it's hard for me to understand. There was just the hate was just unimaginable. So when the Greenwood community, black Tulsans, heard that Dick Rowland was being held in the county jail and that whites were trying to get him out and hang him, I mean, you know, what are you going to do? I mean, they had to do something. The the Washington, I'm sorry, the, the you know the Tulsa County um, jail was surrounded by whites, and they wanted him out. They wanted him to hang him. All he did was trip, but by God, it was a full full blown rape now, and in their own minds. So, the Black World War II veterans were the first to get involved from Greenwood. There was not a lot of them, but there was, you know, there was a few hundred, maybe 200, 200 <clears throat> 250. They go to the courthouse. 
this is not a really smart thing to do, but they just it's what they did. They just didn't want their, their cousin, their son, their uncle, their friend, their neighbor to be hung. They were tired of hangings. So when they arrived at the Tulsa County Courthouse, they mustered at the back of the building, and they were doing this uh, single-line formation the way they were taught in World War I. So out comes Sheriff Willard M. McCullough and a deputy. He came out of the prison. I mean, out of the jail, and he said, "Listen, guys, please. You know, the other side, just the other side of this building, there's hundreds of whites, and you got to get out of here. This is going to be a mess." And he promised them that everything would be okay. So we're going to take care of Dick. We're going to protect him, and he's going to have due process. Go home, please. And and the sheriff was trying to uh, defuse this thing this whole mess without loss of life. Uh, it, was getting to, it was getting to look pretty hopeless. So these guys leave, and things, uh, things calm down for a little while. Now we're in, um, this is the night of the 30th or 31st of, uh, of May in 1921, and it's getting dark. And the jail and the surrounding area looked like it looked like a battle zone, you know, just ready to just ready to erupt. Nothing had happened yet. A lot of yelling and screaming. And what Sheriff McCullough had done with his deputies, he had ordered them to go up onto the top floor of the jail and lock yourselves inside the cell with Dick Rowland. Get in there with him. And so you got three deputies, white. And this, this black, scared kid uh, locked on the top floor inside a cell. And um, the sheriff, I mean, the sheriff knew that if Dick was strung up, you know, there would have been a really bad, it would have been bad, really, really bad between blacks and whites, and he was trying to do something about it. So there they are, hunkered down, and, and McCulloch is outside the jail, talking to the whites, and it's, you know, 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, and pretty soon it was 1,000 people. And it's just, he just doesn't know what to do. So now uh, Greenwood lookouts, people from Greenwood, who were, were they were just lookouts. They, were, they snuck back into the white side of the city and were hiding, and they saw what's going on. And they went back and told their own district leaders, you know, guys, this is a mess. This is a mess. There's a thousand of them over there. They're going to take over that jail. And while well, McCulloch had, had told his deputies to uh, guard Dick Rowan with your life, uh, I doubt they would have done that in the South in those days. I really do. So now the Greenwood community starts pouring in. They're poured into the city. This is a full-on. Now we have not only the uh, return, returning veterans from more black veterans, but we have a lot of other armed black men from Greenwood. And as they were approaching the back of the jail, somebody saw them. It was it was a special called a special deputy. And let me tell you about special deputies. Sheriff McCullough and the Sheriff's Department appointed hundreds and hundreds of special deputies. He didn't have enough men, so he got you know every white man that was willing to uh, shoot or arrest a black person got a badge. They ran out of these little badges, and they put paper paper badges on their shirts, special deputy. And just about every white... In, in the city, he wanted that one. I'll do that. I'll be a special deputy. So one of them saw these guys coming up, some of the front front runners of the black community, and they ran up and disarmed them, which they were allowed to do. They were told to do that, take their arms away. One of these guys, Stan, he refused to give up his pistol because he said, he said, I know if I give this gun up, you guys are just going to run up there and hang the sheriff. I'm sorry, you're going to run over the sheriff and you know, hang this poor dick. I know you guys are going to do that. 
So I'm not giving my gun up. And a fight ensued. The man, the white man tried to take it, and the gun went off. And that was it. That was it. Uh, within seconds, bullets were flying everywhere on all sides of the sidewalk, uh, everywhere around the building, and Sheriff McCall himself had to dive onto the sidewalk to avoid a hail of bullets. And just immediately a full-on war was taking place. Several hardware stores opened up, the sporting goods stores opened up, and they were handing out their weapons, everything they had, given to them, emptying their inventory, bullets, rifles, pistols, and everybody was just going crazy. White men and women, everybody was just shooting. And uh, within probably an hour, an all-white National Guard showed up. And, oh my gosh, what a mess. So, after this melee and the National Guard and all the special deputies, the blacks knew that this, this, this isn't going to work. And they uh, ran back, about a mile back, to the border. Now, now, now Tulsa is a ghost town, and the blacks have retrieved to Greenwood, prepared for the inevitable. They knew that the whites were coming and they'd be in full force. But no one, Dan, nobody could have known how bad it was going to get. Uh, by midnight, we're, we're, the real fighting uh, now moved to the edge of Greenwood. There's a row of shacks. Just imagine, you know, Greenwood was a very nice town. And it was a wonderful town. But at the, at the, there was a set of railroad tracks that separated Tulsa and Greenwood. And there's just some shacks there. And a huge battle took place, and, but it did not take the well-armed whites who greatly outnumbered the blacks very long you know, to win. So I want to stop for a second and have you imagine we've had two chances to stop this thing now. When Tulsa emptied out and the blacks were defeated and chased off, this thing could have ended. The whites could have run over the sheriff and just gone up there, and th their own men uh, upstairs, the sheriffs, the deputies, they probably would have just opened the cell. We're not going to fight a 1,000 guys over this black kid. It, it, that could have ended it. After the fight at the railroad tracks was a second chance. The blacks had been defeated again. Well, go back and get this guy and hang him. I mean, I'm not saying to do that, but it would have been better than the alternative. No, you know, the, the, the whites were bloodthirsty. Everybody was, you can imagine what's going on. And now um, they make another decision. They're going into Greenwood. And this is an end of a city. Let me tell you a little bit about the city. The city of Greenwood was about uh, a mile and a half square. Um, so what I, what I want you to do is to go... Uh, to the Willamette River in Portland, Oregon, and go all the way up Burn Burnside and to about 18th Avenue, go all the way over to above Portland State University and back down to the river. For those of you who are listening who don't know Portland, Oregon, that, that's a, uh, it's, it's a town of about a million people, and that's the downtown section about a mile and a half this way and a mile and a half that way along the river and up towards the West Hills. That's how big Greenwood was. There was 10,000 people living there, 191 businesses, everything, everything that a town needed. I mean, schools and movie theaters and stores and businesses and hotels and hospitals, everything. And the the the... Greenwood residents are now hunkered down in their houses. And they have grown up. They called it uh, Black Wall Street, by the way, Dreamland, a few other places. Black families were driving fancy cars. They lived in beautiful homes. They had neighbor. I mean, you know, they had, uh, I mean, beautiful neighbors. They had yards to die for. So they were very affluent, in other words. Very affluent. Mm -hmm. Now, there was a poor section like there is anywhere, but it was just crazy. They said this was this was the at that time this was probably the richest 
black district in the country. And uh, millionaires, we had black millionaires. So that might help you kind of get a better picture of what's going to happen now. Yeah, so, and that's what I kind of wanted. It was what makes the story fascinating is here you have a group of black people that basically built their own town from money that they actually earn through oil. They learn how to save it and reinvest it and build community, something we hear quite a bit about. Because of one small incident and a lot of frustration on the part of whites not having sort of that opportunity if you you know from coming back to the war, now you've got this tender box, and now you're about to tell us that this incident could have went sort of easily, just take the guy and hang him. But no, he was very well protected and said, that's not the direction we're going to go with this here. And it made things actually worse, as we're about to find out. Yes. So now we have about a thousand armed whites. We have um, 500 National Guardsmen. The National Guardsmen are not only armed, but they have two machine guns on trailers behind jeeps. And we also have something really unusual here, very unexpected. We had planes. There was uh, a couple of white, several, I guess, uh, but not, not a lot. I mean, I, I less than 10, probably close to 10, Tulsans who had their own private airplanes. I had to go back and research that for a second. I, I, you know, 1905, we have the Wright brothers, and, and by the 20s, we have private planes, and pretty cool. Um, some of the farmers, a couple of farmers, had planes to go over their vast, you know, whatever they did. They dropped fertilizers, they uh, inspected, and they were just rich and had planes. So not all of them. I've heard anywhere from two to five pilots agreed to bomb this place. And so we are... And how they did it was they dropped, um, they dropped gallons and buckets of, of things like gasoline, torches, and they made the little bombs, dynamite, and they would fly over and somebody on the plane with them would light something and drop it down on the houses. And this had to be done very carefully because we already had whites moving through and the National Guard moving through, and they didn't, of course, they didn't want to drop a Molotov cocktail on one of their own people. But this is what the Greenwood folks were facing. And the whites went from house to house. They would um, break in, loot them, and if there was anybody alive in there, they would shoot them, and then they'd burn the house down. And then they'd move to the next one. So you have over a thousand people on this little town in, in groups of five or ten, and some of the black chose to stay and fight. That was a mistake. They were all uh, anybody found was was either shot or arrested. Uh, women and children were shot, and of course men were shot. If somebody ran out of the house. They were given uh, a choice to either be shot on sight or go back inside and die as we burn the house. And it and the machine guns, there was only two of them. But I mean, really? And you're you're just mowing the, and they, they're you know they're just ripping the houses apart with guns and machine guns and handguns and rifles and and burning and looting. This was you know this was full blown. This now now we stop using the word riot, Dan, and we have moved to a massacre. Even a miniature genocide, if you will. Yes. You know, and what's alarming about this, it would be one thing if the story was about just 100 white people carrying weapons and trying to get away with this atrocity, but that the National Guard, our own government, was involved in this systematic execution of affluent black people in their own town. Yeah, that should 
should well, really uh, alarm people because it's actually happened to white people on American soil as well. And I think that's what makes this story so intriguing is that it happens on American soil to affluent Americans, and it can happen again. Yes. You know, we have a lot of stuff going on right now that I won't get sidetracked on, but uh, right. there's still a lot of problems going on here. You know, we need to do better. Mm-hmm. So um, now it, 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 it just... Uh, in fact, if, if any of the listeners are welcome, uh, you know, want to, just go, you're welcome to go online and look. I mean, go back and just put uh, 1921 Tulsa riots, and it, it's just devastated. It's just burned mm-hmm. to the ground. Mm-hmm. So house by house, people are either being forced to leave or they die. The numbers go all over the place, Dan. It's, it's almost, it, there's nothing funny about this. But but the, it's almost humorous. Uh, the numbers are just so crazy. But the um, Red Cross was probably you know got the closest around two to three hundred uh, blacks and maybe a couple of dozen of whites died. Hundreds on both sides injured, and most of the Greenwood residents. Now, if you own a home or live in an apartment or anything besides a, a cardboard box with nothing. I want you to imagine this. Okay, right now, whoever is listening, and, and right now, you're, you're not going to hear the end of this because somebody's going to come running into your house and, and you're going to have to run out, jump out the second story, run out the back, and you're going to leave. You don't have your wallet. You don't have your car keys. You don't have anything. You have nothing. I, I, you know, I, I can't imagine that. I'm looking out my window for something soft to land on and knowing that I am going to be driven out of the Tiger, Beaverton, Oregon area outside of Portland, and I'm never going to come back. Everything I own is in that house, but I never get to come back. Even if I did, it's burned to the ground. It's just it's just, it's just mind-boggling to me. And the blacks who um, had not either escaped or had been killed were arrested. And they were corralled in tents in three different sites. There was a a ball field and a couple of large spaces, structures, buildings. And they were uh, arrested and, and, you know, this is a prison camp. They have nothing but their clothes on their back. And they can look across town and see the smoke and see that there's nothing left. It's all gone. Mm -hmm. And... um, uh, there in, in the winter, in the fall, this is in May and June, the, the first couple of days, and within about 48 hours, this town was gone, wiped off the face of the earth. The following winter, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, do the math, there was still a 1,000 Greenwood residents, black people, living in tents. And, um, you know, again, those who had escaped just had nothing. And a lot of them never came back. They just, you know, where where would you go? You know, you live in, in southwest Portland. Where would you, you walk to Bend and hope you can find a job? And it's just crazy. So now... It's also a matter of could you trust anywhere else that you go? <laughs> yeah. It was... Um, so so now, you know, that's it. It's It's done. It's gone. So, you know, what do you do? Where do we go from here? And I, I almost as bad as what had happened, what took place next? I mean, you know, kind of um, uh, the, the readers are probably wondering, you know, what happened next? Mm-hmm. Where do we go from? What do you do? You just So there have been over a hundred attempts you mentioned the name Johnny Cochran. There have been over 100 attempts at some kind of reparation, and nothing, absolutely nothing, not a nickel. Now, <laughs> Greenwood did come back. A few brave people stayed and rebuilt. This is 1921, and by the end of the 20s, it was coming back 
somewhat. And the uh, great, you know, the, the depression uh, just about ended it again. And then by the 1940s, we have another world war, and the demand for oil is up. Greenwood starts, it starts building again. In the 1940s and early 1950s, it, it, was, you know, it never went back to what, to what it was. And, but by the, by the 1960s, it was gone. It had just been, Tulsa had just moved, moved over the top of it. The University of Tulsa, I believe, it's a college there and the city. And uh, in, in the year 2000, there was one block. You heard the size, the whole downtown area of a major city in this country. I mean, you know, mile and a half, two miles square. And now it's one block as, as a historical reminder. Mm -hmm. And right after this thing happened, uh, Sheriff McCall had a problem, and so did the governor. You know, this, this was, this was uh, we didn't have TVs, but we had radios and newspapers. And the, the cover-up, which is what leads up to eventually to what Johnny Cochran and his team tried to do, that the cover-up back in the 1920s was very swift. The Tulsa Sun, the, the main white newspaper, uh, front page line, whites exonerated. Wow. Blacks held responsible. How about that? <laughs> yeah, imagine that. And um, a, a quick uh, response, telling the you know as much of the truth as possible from the black viewpoint, no problem. Just get in there and, and get in there and put the you know put it on your paper, get it out there. Oh, excuse me, geez, I forgot, Dan. Uh, we don't have a yeah, we, we don't have a, a paper. <laughs> the building got burned down. Hmm. So. The blacks couldn't do anything. They couldn't notify anybody. Wait, you know, somebody please hear our side. And it went back and forth for years in the courts, but nothing ever happened. Hmm. Have you yourself looked into the, you know, the latest, uh, this was around uh, 2001, the latest attempt? No, I don't believe I have. And the... Um, these people in Greenwood, they're survivors. And um, we're in the 21st century, and there is about five or six, five, I believe, known survivors, people who are actually there. And a, t two things happened. Johnny Cochran got interested, and uh, uh, he, he built a, a dream team of just fantastic lawyers and all the proof, you know, that you could get. And he got the people together, of course, there's the children and the grandchildren, and all the way through, you know, we have all this, you know, the, the, the relatives of the victims, like, like anything, and like Hiroshima or anything else, and people are trying to get reparation and restitution. I call it restitution, by the way. And that's my word. I invented that word. I did what the um, patent office said years and years ago to mail this, mail it to myself in proof. But uh, restitution spelled D-U-E in the middle because it was due. But no reparations, no restitution, no restitution, nothing. And, um, uh, you know, Johnny Cochran was probably the man to do it. Alongside of this project, was something called Before They Die. You can, you can, there's a, a DVD and there's plenty of things written on it. And these two things going on at the same time got some, they got some attention. And it started rolling. And there was really hope. There is, uh, there was, let's see, the, the survivors were like 90, I'm close there, but 95 to 100 and, I think, years old. And I was reading about it, and they're trying and trying and trying, and suddenly Johnny Cochran passed away. 
but that's okay. You know, we got a, we got a dream team of, of lawyers, and um, you know, it, it, we're going to do this. We're just going to keep going. And the Florida Supreme Court declined, is the word they used. They refused to hear the case. Mm-hmm. Knife in the back, knife in the front. You know, cut the head off the snake. And and the oldest um, remaining survivor died. He was, um, I believe it was in 2008. He was 109 years old. And I, you know, I, 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 I watched those people cry. They sat in the courtroom and they just cried. I'm crying. And, you know, how dare you do that? But we did. And uh, what they got in the end was a little bronze medal on a ribbon that you hang around your neck. And that's, that just says that they were survivors. Mm. Uh, Oliver Hooker, look her up. Olive, excuse me, Olive Hooker. And she is uh, 100 now, still alive. And she actually must be more than 100. Yeah, she might be 100. And uh, she said recently that we must never give up. Never, never give up. And that woman went on to be the first African-American woman to join the United States Coast Guard. Wow. And after that, she went on to get a Ph.D. in psychology. Hmm. Well, don't tell me we don't owe her something. It's a fascinating story, and you were saying earlier in the program that if people wanted to look up this for themselves uh, online, they would just have to look up the, uh, what was it again, the Tulsa riot? Uh, the, the Tulsa 1921 riot. The committee of Greenwood, the city of Greenwood, you know, you can look up Greenwood 1921, but most people just find it by by that. And look at these pictures. Please, listeners, look at these pictures. They have, if you can stomach it, they have pictures of some of the people who were burned alive. Mm. And, I mean, what, you know, how could we do something like that? And most importantly, just remember, if we forget that this happened, it's going to happen again, and actually it has, but it can happen to anyone. And that's the thing to be aware of, is to be sure that there's safety and accountability in place so that it doesn't. And we want to thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program and sharing this story with us. Yes, thank you. I always enjoy being on your show. And please say... um, Hello to that beautiful bride here. She's the one that got me started. You know, <laughs> will do, will do. Thank you so much, Ron, for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. God bless. We want to thank you, the listeners out there, for tuning in. Again, you can find out more. Visit us at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. And also follow us on Twitter at Beyond 50 Radio, hashtag Beyond 50 Radio, to see what's updated and what's coming up as well. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. This is the Beyond 50 Radio Program, and remember, live your day past halfway.